Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Green Tech Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. I'm Becky Worley, and this is the Twit Network's Top 25 Green Tech Innovator Series. This episode of Twit's Top 25 Green Tech Innovators is brought to you by the Eco Imagination Challenge from GE. GE and its partners are awarding $200 million to ideas that help build the next generation power grid for the 21st century. For more information and to view and comment on ideas, go to ecomagination.com slash challenge. It's also brought to you by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash green tech. The traditional sources of renewable energy are solar and wind, but they have a problem. Inconsistency. The sun sets and the wind dies down. So is there a renewable energy source that's sure as the tides? Well, yeah, tidal energy. Just outside of Belfast, Ireland, a company called Marine Current Turbines has installed a 1.2 megawatt tidal energy converter that they call CGEN. The company aspires to one day have enough of these installed that they could generate 5% of the UK's power through tidal, and even more in other coastal regions around the world. Marine Current Turbine's Martin Wright took me out on the water to see for myself. Will you just start by telling me where are we? Well, we're in Strangford Narrows, uh, Northern Ireland, and this is a southeast facing sea loch. So down the sea loch that way is the Irish Sea, and there's a large sea loch in, inland there, which is Strangford itself. So what we've got is a narrow stretch of water and you have this big accumulator there, one side, and another big accumulator the other side. So the tide going through here is pretty ferocious. What about the tide? How extreme is it? I mean, are we talking Bay of Fundy, or what are the, what are the ranges? Ah, right. There are two different things here. There's tidal range, which is everybody sees that alongside the jetty, where, you know, how high is the tide? And what we're interested in is the tidal stream, less about the range. I'm only interested in how quickly the water goes from one place to another, it's that velocity. Here as it happens, it's about a three meter tidal range, but the thing that's really important is it runs on the top of springs up to about 10 knots. So it's very fast, and that's what we're after. What's the water doing? The water is literally moving from one part of the planet to another, so it's a big plug flow. It's just like, you know, a syringe operating here. So it's water rushing down a syringe needle. It's as simple as that. So that movement translates into energy that you can capture. Correct. It's kinetic energy. And the way to think about this is we've just put an underwater windmill in here. So this is amazing. I mean, that it's an optical illusion. I feel like it's moving and we're stationary. Correct. Yeah. And that just shows you the power of the tide. It's running at pretty well um, full speed now. We've got a, about an hour and a half left. Um, and the rotors underneath are producing full power at the moment. Wow. So you can't see the rotors, but under there are two big 16 meter diameter rotors. They're the biggest rotating objects in the sea in the world at the moment. There are no ship's propellers of that size, and they are capturing the energy. So the vast volume of water is going through those rotors and turning them. So that's what I say, it's an underwater windmill. That's really the way to look at it. What about the power output? I mean, how powerful well, is this? Well, this particular machine is producing 1.2 megawatts, which, you know, people say, well, that's not very much. <laughs> Actually, that's a pretty good scale for compared to wind turbines, um, and certainly this stage of the development of the technology. But over and above that, we get a lot of time where it's producing at that power. So for instance, on this tide, we'll probably have been running for about four hours out of a possible five and a half, six. The, the biggest technical challenge is not actually the machine, but it's how you fix it to the seabed. Now, you see behind us, that structure there, the, the way to think of it is at the moment, it's experiencing the, the effect of about a 300 knot wind, right? That's the way to think of it. So how do you stay there to fix this to the seabed? 
and you've got to make sure that when you've fixed it, it's absolutely going to stay there. When this thing is running, the thrust from the rotors is about 100 tonnes. So you've got a lateral thrust of 100 tonnes when it's running, on top of whatever the 300 mile an hour wind is. So the biggest challenge is that, without a doubt. But in getting to that, you have to design a machine which can withstand all of that when you don't actually know what's going on in there, because nobody operates in tide races. Now alongside that, you've got all the regulatory issues, and a really big paradox is that to do something new with the environmental law we have at the moment, um, it's a case of saying, oh no, no it's new, don't do it, the precautionary principle kicks in. So to get through that, so you can actually do it, is very difficult. I'm very glad to say that here, um, the environmental program we've had running has uh, proved that this thing is, well, quote, it has no measurable impact. So the restrictions are gradually being lifted because they're getting comfortable with um, the effect or lack of effect on yeah. the environment. I could ask you what the environmental impact was on marine mammals and fish, but the real well, question is, are cod and haddock getting cuisinarded down there? No, 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 no. This is the idea if you think, it, it, well, you maybe think, it's not like putting your finger in a desk fan, right? These rotors are not driving the water. They are being driven by the water. So the whole flow of the water going through is completely different to something driving it. And so it's very difficult for anything to actually touch them. The other is for the marine mammals. Well, look, marine mammals are high order predators. And think, when we first came out with cars in the UK, you had to go around with a man with a red flag in front because there was a fear that old ladies would be turned to pillars of salt, <laughs> that if you went at more than 30 miles an hour, the wind would be sucked out of your lungs and it was certain death. So we had all of these things to work through. And really the same applies here. But these are high order mammals that do not, as a matter of course, bump into things underwater. They deal with, with their environment. And it is proving to be the case that they're dealing with their environment. So rest assured, this is not a fish blender. We feel good about that. Okay. Well, it's a very inefficient one if it is. <laughs> um, you know, it looks with that bow wake like a boat pushing through the water, and I half anticipate that it's making the same noises we're hearing on our boat. I'm... No. Completely no. Really quiet. Okay, I'm. I'm going to test this theory. Jeremy, will you cut the engine up there? I want to listen. Just a little bit of the sound of water. Which is the wake. You're just hearing the surface there as it goes past the pile. But underneath you, there's nothing. Yeah, noise impact, not much. None. Now, it's coming up on the 100th anniversary of the Titanic being built very close <laughs> nearby. Is this sort of the modern equivalent from an engineering standpoint, a, a modern marvel? And I should point out that that hunk of steel and this hunk of steel are on the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I really like the analogy that much. But yes, we think it's an engineering marvel. That's the first, it's, it's the biggest renewable energy device, a marine renewable energy device in the world. It's manifestly there, it's real, it's producing power, it's produced the most power of anything out there. This ought to be saying loud and clear to legislators, governments, whatever it is, this could happen. This isn't a pipe dream. This isn't a computer model. This isn't something you just throw up on a spreadsheet. This is real. So we could, if we get the right structures in place, start to make this happen and make a difference with it. How many homes can this power? It's 1.2 megawatts, so roughly, on average consumption, about 800. What's your hope for the future? What's the long-term goal to create power with this technology? Well. My hope is that it industrializes properly and quickly. And um, we don't know what the full potential is worldwide, but if I just think about the UK, somewhere between about seven gigawatts and possibly up to about 18 gigawatts of power could be installed. Now, that's somewhere around about 5% of the UK's um, uh, consumption of electricity. With renewable energy, you're never going to get the magic bullet. So this makes a very considerable contribution to that. It's a piece of the puzzle. It's a piece of the puzzle. And we've got, in the UK, we've got a fantastic resource. We're sitting in a location where we've got lots of these uh, spots like this that you could effectively harness. 
Where else in the world? Well, um, you've got, if you look at North America, Canada's got it. I hate to say that for your audience, <laughs> but they've got it. So oh, you put Canadian. some bits of string. You've got it on us again. Yeah, put some bits of string <laughs> up to Canada. But there's a big, big resource there. It's huge um, in Canada. And then you've got areas like Southeast Asia, so Korea, um, you've got the Philippines, you've got areas around India, you've got some uh, spots in Chile, that's a fjordic coastline and has enormous tidal streams, they're very well known down there. So around the world in the mid latitudes where you've got a big lump of ocean and lots of inlets or headlands, um, you will find these sorts of locations and that's really what it is. We're partnering with uh, four of the, the biggest uh, venture capital firms in the clean energy space, three in the US, one in Europe. Uh, you know, again, we think that the combination of GE investment and venture capital investment is going to allow us to increase innovation. It's going to allow us to accelerate new ideas. It puts us shoulder to shoulder with some of the smartest tech investors. And we can use the, what I would call the industrial clout of GE to bring technologies to this marketplace faster. GE announced its challenge at a San Francisco event along with its four venture capital partners, Emerald Technology Ventures, Foundation Capital, Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield and Byers, and Rockport Capital Partners have all joined with GE. Ideas from companies and individuals can be entered through the ecoimagination.com website for the next 10 weeks. So check out ecoimagination.com. We want to take a break from this episode of Green Tech Today to thank our sponsors, Audible.com. Now, Audible.com is a leading provider of audiobooks with more than 75,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature. We're talking fiction, nonfiction, periodicals. Here's an idea that a friend of mine had for Audible books. She plays them in her car when she drives the kids to school. It gives them a little bit of a break, downtime. They don't squabble with each other. And as a family, they listen to some great books. They're working their way through the Harry Potter series right now. And she says it's amazing because they're all at the same point in the book. They can talk about it. And yet it's a little bit of break for her kids as they're on their way to school. Just a great idea on how you could use audible.com books. Now, if you want to try them out, well, what you do, is you just go to audiblepodcast.com slash green tech. There you can download an audiobook for free. And again, it's audiblepodcast.com slash green tech. And you're going to get a free trial of a book if you decide to move on and get the whole Harry Potter series for your family. Well, we would appreciate the support. From an engineering perspective, I think that this structure is a thing of beauty. But if that was my house and this was in my view, I might be a little concerned. Is there any way to get them rip all the way down? Yeah, there will be, and we're, we're working on that. And there's certain locations where that's a more sensible thing to do. The point is that human beings work very well in air. They get very inefficient and expensive if you put them in water. And given this is a tide race where you can't put them down there very long, the ability to lift it out of the water to fix it or to do what you need to do with it, maintain it, put it back down again, is absolutely vital at this stage of the technology. Um, in the future, we would expect, once we've got a lot of confidence with the drivetrains, the bits, the whirly bits, <laughs> we, would, we would expect to have it fully submerged and we're working on that. So yes, in time, of course. Okay, so we won't have the not in my lock issue. You know, that's what we say in the States, not in my backyard. I know, I know. So the not in my lock. Well, that's going to appear all over the place because, um, but mind you, I'm not sure if you have a nuclear power station, I'm not sure that exactly enhances the view if you happen to be looking at it, but there you go. Good point. Property values down. Yeah, this one, is. minor. Though we were very concerned about it here, I have to say, when, uh, when we brought it in. So the point is not trivial because this is an area of outstanding natural beauty. It's, it's a very, very important piece of landscape. Um, but it's been very well accepted. So rather than guessing what they say, we listened to what they've actually said. And I think the, the local people here have welcomed us. And they actually feel it's sort of their turbine. So it's worked well. Talk to me a little bit about the cost per kilowatt of energy or how you would classify this as 
being cost effective as an energy producer? Well, at the moment it's not, it's a prototype and that was fearsomely expensive and you sort of want to park that. Um, but the question is, can it be in the future? And the answer is absolutely yes. And you have to look at the fundamentals. First of all, we can put this thing in the sea at probably about the same cost. We'll start to go tangential with offshore wind. But the resource is fundamentally more energetic. So without me being clever, we should have a lower cost uh, per kilowatt hour of energy. That's such a so, wonderfully British way of saying it. The, the result will be more energetic. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds perky and it also speaks to the fact that it just produces more energy than offshore wind, right? Well, correct. The resource is, it's a better resource. It's as simple as that. It'll mirror offshore wind in probably about a gigawatt is what we, we expect. At which point we should be down to about three million pounds a megawatt installed, producing power at somewhere around about eight pence pence a kilowatt hour. But you have to set that against, and everybody makes a comparison now, you have to think long term. And if you look at the UK, we have a security supply issue, which actually the States has as well. So Meaning to, we don't think we can get oil. Or, or the price of it is going to go through the roof. And so all the metrics are going to alter. The beauty of this is once you've got it in, you know your costs and you have no price volatility and you know what it's going to be over the, over the, over the length of that project. So it's a bit like the, the arguments coming up now are exactly the same as the ones that probably came up in the 1950s for hydro in Scotland. Imagine we were digging huge quantities of coal out of the ground. We had coal-fired power stations all over. Why build hydro in Scotland? What is the cheapest form of energy we have, electrical generation we have in the UK at the moment? Hydro. So you've got to look at it on the basis of all the metrics that are there. This is offshore hydro, right? It's predictable, it goes in the mix, it's contractable, and it'll have a price point which over time is going to be hugely attractive. Believe you me, when Mr. Putin starts turning off the gas tap, right? They'll want these. <laughs> What do you think the um, timeline in terms of when it starts being profitable? You put one of these things in, in your... In oh, the your... next, I mean, there will be support mechanisms to get it moving, as there are. But the, the next project we do has to be profitable. This isn't a, this isn't a game. We've raised um, 30 million pounds to get to this place. So there's got to be a return on that. Now, it works, so there really has to be a return. It's going to take some more money to raise to get it moving, but this has to be a business. There's no question about it. The next uh, uh, set of units has to be a small farm because we've got to see the array effects and we've got to get them in there. So we've a plan to go for that. Um, we've got a choice of a couple of locations. We're moving through a consenting process at the moment and we're looking to raise money. If you have any bright ideas on that <laughs> score, then gratefully received because the credit crunch hasn't left much of it around. But that's the real issue is funding this there are two issues now for taking tidal energy forward. The first is that they're in, in energy you have to create the market because to be brutally honest, the light switch works and uh, the light is on. So people don't actually hanker after marine energy. They just want it cheap and they want the lights to stay on. So you have to create the market, which governments need to do. Having created the market, we've then got to get some serious capital moving into this. But what's really important is people to see this and not think that it's some pipe dream, but it could actually happen. And if we just got behind this now, and my, my biggest concern about this whole business of both global warming but energy security is I'm not sure we fully, as a society, got behind it. I think we're still hankering after the fix of the fossil fuel because it's too easy and it's high energy density. But we need to do this and the results will be hugely beneficial because you know, it, 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 to be operating with what you're, you're getting as the income on the planet as opposed to destroying the planet's capital must make perfect sense. Every business thinks like that. You don't eat your capital, but we do that to the planet. So I'm just hopeful that the credit crisis can either throw us headlong into this or we'll fall back and say, oh, just build another coal power station, it'll be okay. That's my worry. We need to do this. That's it for this episode of Green Tech Today. If you have any comments on the show, please email us. We're greentechtoday at twit.tv. 
You can also leave us a voicemail. Thanks for watching. I'm Becky Worley.